<clears throat> all right, so we talked about the last time we talked about UML diagrams, uh, sorry, the class diagrams. All right, so I explained that the, the main thing you need to uh, know is how do you read and understand these diagrams? And number two, how do you, uh, given a description, can you um, write some of the structural high level class diagram for the system? Sometimes we'll see that in the uh, interview. All right. Uh, two more diagrams, I think it's really easy, um, simple, uh, but this one is not really simple. Um, it could get complicated, but then you will still be able to see the usage of the sequence diagram at some point. All right, so that's why we wanna briefly talk about this one. All right, so for sequence diagram, it tried to talk about the sequence. All right, so that's why this is not a structural anymore. This is more about behavior about algorithms and I, I told you in the class diagram you cannot really put any of algorithms to visualize those and then we need to rely on the other diagram the sequence is one of them and obviously this one talks about a different process a different kind of workflow uh, how do your um, you know, functions or code execute step by step and how the different components are interacting with each other this is called a sequence diagram. Again, I think our expectation is that you get, just need to understand how the sequence diagram works. Um, very rarely you need to write and draw the sequence diagram by yourself. Okay, if you can do that, that's good. But um, in practice, maybe that's really not too, uh, it's not really used that often. Some of the basic concepts. So it's basically an interaction diagram that models a single scenario to execute. Right? It focuses on one thing in each diagram, and then it focus on how you how the different components are interacting with each other in a certain kind of a scenario or concept. All right, so this is the second most used UML diagram. That's why I still want to show this one here. All right, so let's just take a look at the example and pretty easy to understand. All right, so you got a different agent or object. One is a user. This is a library computer, so users go to log into the library computer to do something, and then you can then try to uh, borrow books, request for books, so their database for books. So these are main components or object you have in the system, and the way they interact with each other are based on different kind of things or tasks you're doing, right? So the user can log in to the computer, and the computer will need to authenticate with the database, and then the database will send the things back to acknowledge that and then you log in, um, or you got a wrong password, you will receive that notification. If you log in successful, um, successfully, then you can just type the book name to search. That's gonna search for the database. The database give you a result, and then whether you find it or not. And if you find it, you want to request for issue of the book, and then we change the status, and then you got a book, you log out, and then give you a response, right? So as you can see, this one talk about how can you issue a book from a library and in terms of software system, how, you, how your system is gonna be built. You know, once I give you this diagram, as you can see, it really helps you to understand, okay, so when I write this piece of code, I will need to have access to these three different components. And I need to run these things one by one in sequence. And also there are different kind of if statement, I need to check result and then it, it depends on the result and what I wanna do. And then how each function will be implemented when I try to log in. And what's really happening in this library part, we need to access the database and then, and then verify everything. So if I give you this kind of a diagram, for sure, it's gonna help you to understand all the details. And also I think it will be easier for you to code it, especially if you already have these components ready to use. So I think that's really the purpose of uh, the uh, sequence diagram. This one really used a lot in some of these uh, tasks that's, that's involved some kind of uh, uh, user flows, steps, uh, involved with some kind of complicated sequential algorithms. Right, but then if your thing is really simple and easy, then you don't, you don't really need to model those with um, a sequence diagram. So actually, if this one only happens within one object only, so these are some of the concepts, uh, they call it a participant. Okay, that's basically the object, object or entity that acts in the sequence diagram. 
And then you also have a message. That's basically the communication going on. And you use access it in sequence diagram. Of course, there are a lot of these details, the horizontal line, the vertical line, how does that work? Yeah. So this is another example. And then think about this one here. It talks about how the customer try to search something, okay, in uh, uh, some kind of a database. So the customer go to the search page and to trigger that with this method on search. Here, you type all the search criteria and then we need to verify that one. If that's just good, and then you go to search for it from the catalog, all right? From the catalog, if you find it, then you create some kind of result page. That one will be returned and then to the search result page and then display that, right? If something wrong happening, you should see the error message here. Okay, again, once you see this one as you build a system, you will know, okay, I need uh, different pages to deal with different things. I need a catalog database. I need to uh, allow customer or user to use all of this. All right. So again, this kind of diagram really helps you to understand the sequence, the uh, workflows of your system, especially the part where they, it interacts with users. And then these are more details, okay? You don't need to memorize any of those. Uh, they have some kind of underscores that shows different things, uh, different kind of lines. I think these are okay just to talk about uh, how we specify the participants, the objects. And the message is the same thing, that's the syntax where you put the message name, arguments, all of this. Again, but in reality, they're not really following this 100%. And these are more things for the message. You can go something really complicated. So you can have this kind of return thing. You can have this one, which means asynchronized call. So yeah, a lot of very detailed specification, definitely uh, very helpful. But you know, again, in reality, it's just a matter of how much you're following. And then lifetime of objects. So uh, basically there is a, you can use this kind of a use this kind of cross sign to mark the end of some kind of object life cycle to tell okay so this one is done and uh, i think this one probably is more useful in c in java you basically don't need to worry too much about it because all of this are handled by the garbage collection and yeah so there is this thing called activation i think that that is the box that shows that you, you're going to trigger something Active something again. These are very detailed uh, specification. I just want you to show. I want to show this one to you so that you know. One day, if you want to draw this one by yourself, you need to go back and should look at all the syntax requirements. You can do more complex things like loops, conditional statements. So literally, this one could be almost as detailed as your code. All right, so that's how you can. But this is very rarely used as like loops stuff. All right, but then conditional definitely very useful. You can even link different sequence diagram together. Um, again, I'm just bringing all this uh, uh, the specification to you. So the UML is, is a very big topic that has a lot of details going on. So you can link different diagram together to link all the different workflows. There are some kind of dependencies. Right, so that's another example. Shopping cart, okay, so you got a storefront page and then cart and also inventory. Very similar to the library example. Because from here, you can add item to the cart and then you need to reserve that from the inventory. And, and then you can run this whole process back and forth. So this is a loop. Once you're done, you trigger and activate the checkout process. Process order, the confirmed order, once you confirm that you place order, that needs to update the inventory. So it's really a clear way to show you the high level idea about the whole sequence. And one of the places where you will see this one very often, you know, at least for me, I remember that, uh, I don't know how many of you have done uh, implementation to implement uh, ORS2, um, this kind of a standard for the authentication. So the ORS2 is a very popular way to, to do the authentication today. It basically means that you, if you build your own site, you want you don't want to build your own authentication system, well, you can use others' login system for your site. Okay, I solve two problems. One is you don't have to save all the users' and password and everything. Number two, sometimes you want 
you people to load the resources from other uh, places that you, you need to use or so for example if you want people to uh, you want to pull people's Facebook or Twitter messages or profile information those are on the Facebook or Twitter site so you need to authenticate with them so using the, the third party authentications for your authentication purpose there is a standard called OORS right so implementing this OORS process step by step you know, it, it's not really an easy thing to do. If, if some of the libraries, SDK simplified it, that's good. Uh, a lot of the time you actually have to implement all of this by yourself, step by step. You need to understand how the authentication works, right? So basically you will find a lot of this kind of diagram to explain how the OAuth works. All right, so basically this is the user, the end user. Now uh, this is the consumer. Consumer is, means that the application you are building and then this is the service. Service means the, the actual Google, Facebook, Twitter, where they have all the content, all the user information. So you start with that your, your application need to request a token from the service to, so that the service will know, for example, Facebook will know, okay, I'm building my personal app and this app want to use my, my uh, data of my user. And so they need to approve it. So they need to give you a token. And then, so you send that token back to the user and to tell user, okay, could you log in with your Facebook or Twitter with this token? So that Facebook is, will know that this is for my application. All right, so you're sending that request to Facebook or Google and then you do the login and everything. Once it's done, then they will give you a confirmation. Okay, once you log in successfully, then you will be redirected back to your app to here with all the information that um, coming from the service. So this application will know, oh, actually you have been authenticated and then they give you another token. From then on, you can use this token to access all any of the data about that user. For example, I wanna get your profile picture and I can use that, that token to fetch that one from the service because you already gave the permission um, um, to this application. And then you do that back and forth to do all the requests. So this is the OAuth authentication, OAuth 2 authentication. All right. So how do you, how do you uh, allow user to give permission to, on, on the other services, um, to use their data on the other services? Again, implementing all of these steps, uh, it's not easy. Depend on how easy, how good the SDK is. Um, some of the pay, famous one like Google or Twitter, I'm sure their SDK should be pretty easy to use. There's a lot of like, code samples you can use. But some of those, if you need to implement everything from scratch, it will be uh, definitely taking some efforts. But this diagram really explains how the OWASP works. Okay. Uh, for me, I really hate to implement OWASP. That's, uh, I, I got the idea, but the implementation part always is tricky. All right, and then why don't we just code the whole thing? Why do we need to draw the diagram? And obviously, you know, it's, uh, it's still kind of at higher level. You don't need to worry about all the low level code, the variables, all of those stuff. And this is language independent. So it can, same idea, can be implemented in different languages. And then you know, it's relatively easier, especially for the non-developers. Um, so obviously this, uh, that's the whole purpose of a uh, UML diagram is try to visualize that in high level, give you an easy way to communicate, uh, to understand the system, all of those. All right. So any questions about um, sequence diagram? Uh, uh, Rush, what does what do you mean? Looking at the Oculus. Oh, okay. I see. All right. Yeah, Christian. So good question. So um, I'll summarize that one. Not, not very often. Okay. So this example I gave you about OORs is one place that you see very often. So this sequence there one is mostly for you to read and understand. Very rarely you will be asked to write it. 
okay, to create it, and then we implement something, just code it, and then nobody asks you to do this paragraph first. As sometimes people need to discuss, and then people start to draw all of this. That's that's a very common scenario. But then we we draw it very form, informal way. Okay. Um, but but then it's it's pretty common to see some kind of a documentation that had this kind of information. Okay, that I, I chose this example because I I saw a lot of this one when we try, were trying to do the OWASP authentication. They try to explain the process. Obviously, this is the easier way to explain it rather than using the text. But definitely not a too much important skill to use. Oh yeah, exactly, Robert. That that thing. Google, the, the good part about Google is they gave you a very good sample code. Normally just copy paste, it should work. I, I had a very good experience with Google's uh, ORs, but not, not all the other uh, um, services. Yeah, the best way is they give you the code, you just replace all those, those attributes and then that's, that, that's the best. All right. All right, so the last diagram I want to cover, which is probably the easiest diagram, all right, it's, it's called a use, use case diagram. And the reason I talk about this one is I, I personally seen people are using this one in the company. And that's how I realized that this one is useful. This is really easy to just try to explain the use case of your system, features, functionalities, how, what people can do. So it's a scenario based technique in your UML. Very easy, let's just get to the example. So basically, uh, it, uh, it tried to highlight what the system does rather than how to do it, all right? So they focus on the scenarios. It's called a use case. Um, so here's a scenario for a medical clinic. A patient calls the clinic to make appointment for a yearly checkup and then the receptionist find the nearest empty time slot in the system and the scheduled appointment. All right, so that is a use case. All right, so we need to summarize this kind of use case so you can write something like this. All right, the patient, and then communicate and make appointment, and that's it. That, that, that's basically, when you see this one, oh, you know that, okay, so there is this kind of use case here about the system, um, who is the user, patient, what they can do, uh, make appointment. So we have a lot of this one listed, and then you will see how, what are the features you need to build for your system. Again, there are also a lot of a syntax. This is how you describe an actor. This is how you do the communication. And then this one here is your use case. Um, in practice, as I told you, I do see a lot of people drawing this one on the whiteboard, on the glass wall, uh, very, very typical. Okay, so they're talking about, okay, the customer can do this kind of things. Place order, they can request help, they can, um, what's that? I can't, can't uh, read it. Post uh, read product reviews, post product reviews, return product. Okay, as you can see from here, you can immediately get, okay, for our system, what, what are the ultimate features the user can do? It's definitely very helpful for you to kind of scope your project. To place order, and then you will need to do some of those. That's gonna be interact with some other things. This one is uh, laundry cart. And then this is shopping cart, and then shipper, all of those. So you can see how this different agent are, are going to be using the system, interacting with each other. Okay, so in practice, I do see people drawing on this one when they start to talk about the system. Yeah, okay, inventory, sorry about that, yeah. Um, that's, um, uh, that's, that's, that's how the use case diagram has been used in practice. Uh, I think this one is very useful in the beginning to scope what they're trying to do. In many cases, we have a lot of features to implement, but you know, because of time, there are only limited things we can do. All right. So again, at the end, you know, to, to summarize GML, all right, so definitely it's not as popular as in the late 90s or early 2000. Um, but for us, you, you will still need to know, it, especially for the class diagrams. So later on, we'll talk about design patterns and we'll talk about other uh, principles will still need to use UML a lot, right? And then um, um, uh, you know, one good thing about this diagram is if you have that one, it's, it's easier for us to understand some of the details and also it provides us a foundation for discussions, all right? So we can 
or look at the same thing and, and quickly abstract all the major issues and concepts to talk about. And then, as I mentioned here, you know, in reality, doing some kind of whiteboard, uh, you know, sketching diagrams is, is more practical, useful than using the tool to do it. Very rarely people still using the tool to draw this too time consuming. With that time, you probably already got the code done. All right. And then finally, don't forget that this one will be used in uh, interviews sometimes. Okay. A small portion of the question are based on this, but it, it could happen. All right. So these are all the things I want to cover for UML diagrams. Uh, not really, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this one. If we're talking about this course 15 years ago, maybe we're spending half of the course on UML, but you know, now I think just one lecture is enough. All right. Okay, very cool. Any questions about the UML? All right, and then uh, I, oh, somebody also asked me, speaking of the interview, there, there is a career fair, right, in the coming tomorrow. Is that the tech career fair tomorrow? Right, so how many of you are planning to go? I think everyone should go, okay. Take a look at what's going on and get some experiences. Uh, yeah, it is virtual. Uh, not sure how they're gonna handle it, all right. But um, there's a couple of things about, to know about the career fair, okay. Number one, it's very where to go because the chance is um, uh, higher than you're doing online applications. Uh, on one hand, you're not gonna have that many applications because it's only for the campus. Okay, and then secondly, if the company decide to go to this um, event, they're serious. I think the company need to pay for some fees to get there. And now it's virtual, it's all easy, but in the past, they actually have to spend a day to send a couple of people here, set up a booth to do the hiring. Okay, so, so there's a cost, right? So if they're doing this one, they're serious. Also very importantly, if they were deciding to do this, uh, that means that they uh, are okay if you are not having a lot of experience because they know you are all in college. Also, they probably have some kind of good uh, feedback about the students within the campus, right? So maybe they hire somebody before, they really like them, they still wanna come back to our campus to, to, to hire more, right? Because all of these reasons, I think the career fair is, um, it's definitely you're gonna have more chances than than the typical job app, uh, applications. Of course, I know that the big company probably won't show up, uh, especially here. In the past years, we we do start to see Google or Microsoft sometimes, but I don't know, not not every year. Sometimes they show up, probably they just giving kind of a information session, and you still need to apply online. Uh, so that's uh, uh, that, that's normally what happens. However, um, I highly recommend everyone go and then try. All right, so the, the chance will be much higher than before. All right, and you really need to kind of be prepared and then to um, uh, do some homework. Okay, one important thing, guys, you, 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 since this, this one, you, um, you, you should be able to find out who is gonna present, right? So let's see. So you should be able to find out the actual list of companies, right? Friday, engineer, high tech. Okay, so can you see all employers? Does this one mean all the ones that are coming? All right, so yeah, so you should actually take a look at uh, the list of companies that's gonna to present tomorrow and find out the ones that you're interested in and also relevant to your background. 
and that you should be very specific, uh, you know, doing some preparation for these companies. When you talk to them, and because they, they're basically the way it works, you know, you all seen the, what happening on campus, just line up and then talk to the people, they get a resume, they answer a question. Um, you know, you, you, you should try to think about how can you stand up, right? Um, a, a couple of ways. I think number one, you need to show that you got a pretty good understanding about about what they're doing, right? This is uh, this company. I know it. One of our um, students did an internship there, so I think that's why they start come here to to our campus. This AI company, All right? So they um, uh, take a look at what they're doing, and then um, and then try to see the possible careers, what kind of position they're, they're looking for, look at what they're doing, right? So it looks like they're doing a lot of AI stuff, right? they've got a lot of collaboration with JPL, all of this, right? So when you start to talk to them, then you really need to be very, very prepared. You can say, oh, you know what? I'm very interested in AI. I, I recently started to take a couple courses. And then I, I want to learn more. Maybe I, I may start taking some of the uh, online, some of this AI course that's from Kasara. I learned uh, neural network, I knew, I learned CNN, I learned this, I, I started to use a lot of a library. So I find it really very cool. So um, what kind of, uh, for example, you can throw some questions. So what kind of libraries are you actually uh, using inside company? Do you use TensorFlow? Do you use Keras? Uh, all of those, right? Um, and then also if, for example, this position, this company does some kind of a cloud computing, and then you can say, oh, you know, I recently started to do some kind of web service project in one of my software engineering courses. And then we're actually building a full stack uh, web service. We use Node.js for the backend. We use MongoDB for the database. We use um, uh, JavaScript and React.js for the front end. And, um, you know, next time we're gonna try to deploy that in the cloud. Uh, so I think that position actually looks very interesting to me. I really enjoy working on web services. So my point is that you, when you talk to them, you shouldn't be just passively waiting for questions. You should kind of already know what they're doing, what they're looking for, and then you should try to talk uh, your, your experience that's relevant to what they're looking for. That's how they can remember you, okay? Because if I, you know, I heard that you already know my company very well, you tend to kind of start to talk a lot of things relevant, um, no, I, I'm going to remember you very well uh, because most students won't be able to do that. So doing some homework is really important. Okay, take a look at um, the the list here. I, I I'm pretty sure that these, these are this looks like very a lot of good companies. Okay, so the technical company, engineering company, not all computer science, but um, um, I think computer science should be always the the most. All right. Let me see. Uh, Yeah, so definitely a lot of our companies. This one here, they hire a lot here on our campus. But the location not very good. They're in a very east part. Okay, I don't know where, but uh, their the location not too good. Too good. Yeah, Northrum definitely do a lot of hiring here. Okay, so all, all good company to try. I think Northrum, uh, the this uh, this uh, Navy Air. Um, all, all good places to try um, to start with. And uh, no, I, in my opinion, if you can go to tech companies, I wouldn't recommend you to go to the military companies. Uh, it's, it, it's just not uh, too technical. And the environment, everything is, is quite different. I, I wouldn't recommend uh, the young people to go to the military com companies. The pace is gonna be slower and the environment and culture is different. Okay, but you know, again, when you are applying, as I told you last time, you shouldn't be too picky. Let's get that application out all, and if they give you the offer, if the offer is not good, then you don't have to go. All right, but you, you should get the offer first. Okay, uh, that's that's always uh, something you should uh, consider. Another thing now, now that reminds me, uh, a couple two years ago, uh, three years ago maybe, I had my student that went to the career fair. He didn't look at a lot of company, but he talked to a couple of them and then got pretty good result. It turns out that he stopped by the booth and then just 
show the guy an app, app he made. I think one of them maybe are talking about something about mobile development. So he had a, he took the uh, mobile development course and then he had an app build and then he has that Android app in his phone. He just pulled the phone, oh, you know, you see, this is the recent app I built. And then that's also very, very impressive because most people can't really just pull their phone and find an app they built. All right, so that's, that's how people can remember them. And then he actually ended up with having a local company and then a year later, he changed the job and then moved to Bay Area. And um, I think uh, uh, a pretty good uh, example of how quickly you can, you can switch job and then go to better positions. All right. But again, remember what I'm, I'm, I told you today. Number one, do enough homework. Number two, think about something to show about your skills or just mention some of the relevant skills. But that depends on how well you know about this uh, uh, company first. All right, and then David, you, you, you mentioned about these appointments, are, are these online or it was uh, before the uh, pandemic? Um, this was the one that happened right before school started. Okay. And it was the same format on Handshake. And so you sign up for different time slots. Right. And what I found, I, in hindsight, I should probably be looking pretty far ahead, like as soon as they're announced to sign up. But I signed up for appointments about a week ahead of time. And most of the bigger corporations or the different companies that seemed more interesting were fully booked up. Um, I did find a few that looked cool. Um, I signed up for four different appointments. Only one of the appointments was like the, the recruiter actually showed up on time. The other ones I just sat there in the waiting room and they never came. And then one of those three people called me later in the day on a private phone number, basically explaining the whole pyramid scheme style programmers hire out programmers to do their work and you get so many programmers underneath you and you move up in the company kind of thing. I was like, okay, well that's weird and I'm not doing that. So um, I thought that the one inner, like the one meeting I had with a recruiter was productive. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It was just a weird format. I, I think getting in on it early and signing up for the appointments with the, with the companies you're really interested in would be better. They didn't have any kind of uh, group inner, uh, like group information sessions or anything right. like that. Like it sounds like they do this time. So maybe that could be better, but it was just weird. I see. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, not to surprise because, you know, some of this is a top company. If you see the lines on campus before, it was, it was really long. And then if they do the online time slot, I guess they have to probably break it down into a half hour. That's not going to be too many time slots. So that's, it's all right. You know, just that's why if that's the case, I think that's a very good feedback. Probably you need to be very specific to, to this target. Okay. To know what you want, you're looking for, and then, uh, you know, have your goals and target. And then, oh, Trilio is also here. That's actually good. Um, yeah, some yeah, lot lot of good ones are are here. I definitely take a look. At. Turner is a construction company. Uh, I don't know if they're looking for software engineers, but uh, also a big one. All right. Yeah, the UPS, I don't know. I, I don't think they're coming here for the software engineer. They probably just have here for the warehouse stuff. Okay, so uh, this one I wouldn't recommend. ISRI, is that a the GP, GIS company? Yeah, so it's in the where Redland, right, on the east. So yeah, we we have a lot of students working there. Yeah, got it. All right, very cool. 
Yeah, that was a question, uh, Amanda. So if we don't have much experience, yeah, well, that's what I told you last time, right? So they, they, um, you always apply, okay? If you don't talk to them, then nothing will happen. And then also I explained that if they come to campus to hire, they're not gonna expect you to have tons of experience. Okay, yeah, so that, that's the nice thing about the career fair. Uh, because if they require sometimes three or five years experience, maybe they mean it, and, um, but then they will not come to campus uh, to do this kind of hiring, right? So they don't mind of being fresh. But again, that doesn't mean that you just go there, you have zero experience, you can always be successful. Eventually, you just want to somehow be differentiating yourself. You need to stand out from all the applicants. Um, you know, try to figure out a relevant experience. So whatever question they ask you, try to connect your own experience with it. Okay, it's, it shouldn't be too difficult. Okay, so it's face the software development, you can always connect to, you know, at least one of your course project assignments to say, oh, you know, I, I did something about that one. And um, for example, in this course, I did this, I use this tool. You know, maybe even though I haven't, I didn't use too much, most of my teammates did it, but I, I had some basic idea on how the JavaScript and React Gen works. Something like that. Always mention something relevant. All right. And also don't be, as I mentioned last time, don't be intimidated by the, by the jobs that, that sound, looks like a very, requires a lot of a experience. Uh, that's maybe where the opportunities sit, sit, okay? Because most of the student won't be, you know, apply. For the interview, I, that depends on what they do, okay? Um, if we're talking about like on campus in that line, uh, they're not gonna ask you too many questions. I, I, I don't think they're gonna ask you the hour questions, probably very basic uh, questions or maybe behavioral questions. Um, so you can you can kind of Google some of the typical behavioral questions like uh, what is a uh, like a challenging project you did right so or or uh, you know what is it what's your strengths and all of this in general um, I think I I don't know if I talked about this last time in a in a regular tech interview uh, we do not ask behavioral questions for most of companies at least for the top companies people don't ask. Uh, behavioral questions uh, in in other main uh, domains especially business marketing those major they ask you all behavioral questions for cs it's useless okay so very rarely they would ask you oh, what's your most challenging project that's one typical question uh, what's the challenge you overcome and also they ask you oh what's your strengths and then a follow-up question what's your weakness and then and then the business people will often say, oh, my weakness is, you know, I sometimes I'm, I'm too perfect. I want to, um, <laughs> I, just, I just try to do everything in my perfect way. Uh, it, it's, it's pretty much, I think, you know, for CS, this is total bullshit. It's, it's useless. So that's why people don't bother asking you these kind of questions. All right, so it doesn't get any kind of information. We, we do coding only. I think that's, that's a good thing because it's very fair. Okay, so it really doesn't matter what school you graduate, it doesn't matter whether you can talk or not. So let's just do some coding and then everyone can see your skills. And the engineers all appreciate your coding skill. They don't appreciate all this bullshit kind of questions. All right, so, uh, but you know, for this one, I, I have no idea. They may, I, I think if, if it's a very technical question, I think they will still, still throw some of the technical questions that's uh, appropriate for the kind of a conversation-based interview. I may ask you what's the difference between an uh, interview, uh, sorry, interface and abstract class. I may ask you uh, the differences between a real list, list, list uh, a link list, something like that. And then I may ask you, could, oh, ha have you, do you know anything about singleton pattern? Okay, that's another kind of a question they may ask you. So we'll talk about singleton pattern maybe in two or three weeks. Uh, so they, they uh, but not too much coding questions. Professor? Yes. Uh, what would you advise someone that uh, who lied in the interview and got the job? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Uh, so, 
what would you say like uh, someone like uh, lied in the interview and they did get the job? Like for example, the requirement was Python and like other languages, but then you lied about Python. You don't really know Python. Oh, oh, you sorry. You lied your lied the skill, and then and then eventually you you got a job. Yeah. So what 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 would you advise them to do? Uh. Well, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, so so let me clarify. You said you lied the skill, and then you you got an offer. Is, is that is that the situation? No, so I I lied on the interview uh -huh. that I know Python, but I I don't know Python as much as they expect. Right. So I'm asking like, well, <laughs> should I like forget the job and just like don't don't answer them anymore? Or? Have you got an offer? Yeah. Oh, you got an offer. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I got the offer, but I lied. Oh wow! Congratulations! No, 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 no. I, I know. I think. I think. Why? 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 Why do you want to stay away? I mean, you can learn Python. How How many times you say you need a Python? I I think they, they, two hours to learn Python, right? I'm sorry. I think you only need two hours to learn Python. Why? Why? What's what? What's what? What bothers you? Yeah, Python no. I, yeah, I mean the basics. Yeah, for sure. It's. I mean, this is pretty oh. similar. But the issue is that. Uh, um, like like when it gets to like um, using different uh, libraries and like uh, interfaces, that's like some things like I'm not really sure. Like uh, oh, I think there's one that's library called that Selenium that they use. Yeah, well, I think you know. Let me put it this way: I, I think the the hiring people, especially for the technical hires, people are not stupid. Okay, I think whether you lie or not, I mean people control it, and then maybe you feel, you think you, you kind of. Uh, Lied a little bit. I I won't call it light. Okay, so you just maybe mention something like extra, right? So that's very typical. I won't consider the lie, but at the same time, I don't think they're that stupid that they they can't tell. So maybe they don't really care, right? Because you know, you see see some of the comments our our classmates put. How difficult is Python, right? I think literally, if you know C plus plus Java, you you just need one hour to learn Python, the basic syntax. You you're good to go, and then you are asking about the interface and libraries. Those you, you do that with Google, right? Uh, uh, you always Google and try to figure things out. So, from import from company point of view, I don't see why people will will care too much about their experience in Python because if you know C plus Java, everyone will, will know that you can get Python pretty quickly. So nothing wrong with it, and and they they're just not um yeah they're they're not just um uh, that be specific on how how much. Python experience you already have so far. Which which company is that? Uh, so it's a, a startup. They're doing, uh, I think it's called, a, they're going to name it a Webflower. Okay. It's going to be a mix of, uh, I don't know, uh, the Q learning and, and deep learning related very good. to uh, searching. Yeah, yeah, I mean, very good. Let me ask another question. Is this a paid position or not? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They they pay. They, okay. They pay pretty good. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on, that's good. Congratulations. That's that's awesome. Uh, it's uh, it's, it sounds like a pretty. How many interview uh, like did you do? Uh, I did four. Oh, four. Wow. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So no, I I, I don't think that's anything that's like uh, random. I I think you did pretty good job. Uh, it it just again anyone won't be. To pick it on, on Python. If your coding is good, then everyone can pick up Python very quickly. And I think you did four interviews. I, I think there's, um, looks like that's, uh, is that with four people? Yeah, four different people. Yeah, then, then you know, just be confident. You're, you're really impressive. Okay, it's just uh, because the people will, will type their comments and they will have some discussions. And if, if you got a mixed uh, feedback, then you won't get offered. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I'm kind of sure about the Python, but now if you mix it with the artificial intelligence and stuff like that and all those algorithms, and if you want to connect and write it in, so pretty much what I did was that I, I wrote it in Java and then I tried to transfer it to Python. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's I, fine. No, no, that no, took no, way to learn Python. Python is so easy, okay? The Java, I, I, I was the same position. I was a more, more of a Java guy and then, um, the, you will find that the, uh, a program that takes 50 lines of Java code, you probably need like less than 10 lines of code in Python. So it's, it's only getting easier, okay?
All right, thank don't, you. Don't worry. And you know, trust me, they, they hire you, they're not stupid. Okay, nobody is stupid. This is a pretty serious position. We don't need to ask you how much they pay. If they pay, okay, nobody's gonna kind of waste their money and time and resource on hiring somebody that's you know um, that's that doesn't fit. Okay. So never never you know uh, <laughs> doubt your about yourself. Okay, they 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 hire you for, for reasons. Awesome. Yeah, congratulations. That's that's great. Thank you. Yeah, pretty good comments here. All right, see people gave you the Python tutorial links. I think in YouTube, there are a lot of uh, videos about learning Python in one hour. You can take a look at that one. Uh, yeah, so it, it's really easy. I, now, I, to be honest, two years ago, when I started coding Python, I, I don't like it. Uh, one big reason is um, because the interpreter-based language, a lot of um, errors, uh, it's, it's not stable at Java. Java, you can find it earlier or sooner where Python is uh, a lot of runtime errors. But I have to say that after, you know, coding Python for one, one, two years, not much big project, mostly for the education purposes. Uh, I, I have to say that it's, it's really um, fast, okay, convenient. Um, I, I see the reason why, uh, you know, people are all switching to Python. For sure, it's, it's much easier to use than Java. Um, it, it, but then I, I, I can see it's, it's better for prototyping things, for for running specific things, especially for AI data, data analysis. Uh, but for the backend, I still feel, uh, I, I kind of still prefer Java, that kind of language. I personally really like Python. It's so easy to get your thoughts out mm -hmm. that you are um, trying to write without having to write a ton of code or yeah. worry about exact syntax and stuff like exactly. that. So yeah, that's a very good summary. Yeah. Yeah. You'll get it quick. All right. Yeah. I mean, do more. Once you get to the company, get some referrals to the rest of us. And, uh, it sounds like a good position. Where is the company based? Uh, it's based on Santa Monica. Very good. Wow. Yeah, yeah, the, pay, the pay should be good. Yeah, the, the the it's a pretty expensive place. So yes, for now they said they pay forty dollar an hour, but they said uh, they'll they'll raise it. No, based that's on the experience. awesome. That's awesome. Very good. Yeah, yeah. That that that's basic. Forty hours should be like eighty uh, k or something around that. I think. <clears throat> Perhaps. And then trust me, in half hour, one hour, you easily get a hundred thousand. Okay, if you change the company, very easily. Okay, you, you just need to be active. In, the, in Santa Monica is a good area. There, there are quite a lot of uh, companies. Yeah. Okay, so um, so Catherine, uh, what are you saying that uh, you know knowing just one language is kind of a disadvantage? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I, I don't think so. It depends on the company. Okay, for big company, for sure, it's not a disadvantage because I, I, I explained last time when you do the coding question interview, it, it, nobody asks you to write specific language. Nobody, and then you write Python, you write C plus plus, you write Java every engineer can understand that easily okay don't worry about that one they really don't care about it because whatever language you know you still need to learn tons of things once you join the company and then the big company have so much money and then they don't mind then spending half months one month to train you okay i know in facebook they gave you a whole month's training okay before they, they send you no matter which office you join they send you to to the Bay Area headquarters, do one whole month's training. You have to live there, even though some people join other offices. 
only training purposes, no development. So they, they don't mind paying you a month to do the training. So that's why the big company really don't care about the languages. However, the small companies do, okay, for sure. You know, we hired, and I, I explained to you last time about this uh, position we posted in India. I, I literally, we don't, we don't care about the algorithm. I just care about, have you done React before? If you've done it, good. Because I know that system is, is really nothing hard in terms of algorithm. I, we don't need you to do any kind of a, a sophisticated uh, searching or ranking system algorithm. All you need to know is how do you do the React? How do you write the change of friend then? It's a, about experience. So, so for small companies, they're obviously looking for somebody who have experience who can jump in on the board to, to contribute right away, uh, they, they, they will care. So there is a difference, okay? But then the, 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 the truth is that you cannot have too many time to learn everything. So you only probably can do one or two extra language or tools. So that's why your major goal should still be the big company in the beginning because um, you might be more qualified to those. Um, but still try to get one or two skills, whether it's a mobile or it's a web development front end, back and get one or two skills, okay, so that you can still try, can try some other uh, positions. That's, that's my, my suggestion. Well, uh, for the language skill set, I think you should still put uh, a long list. Okay, there, uh, it won't take you too much space and then you don't need to be humble on that one because everybody will, will put a long list. Then if you don't put a long list, then you know, maybe, maybe they just feel this candidate is a little bit weak, right? Um, but I do agree that when you talk to them, when you show some of the experiences, you should try to highlight the ones that are relevant. Yeah. Again, language is one or two language is really a very, a very minor thing in, on a resume, a very minor thing. For big company, definitely it's, uh, it's not important. Uh, sorry, Jimmy, what is ATS? Well, for resume, I, I, I think you should never do Word document, right? It should always be PDF because that's, that's the best presentation. The Word, the format is not reserved, preserved, and then that, that's, that's very bad format. Okay, it, it should be always PDF for sure. Yeah, that, that I don't know. I, I don't know if they use software to filter it, um, maybe, but, but it's, it's only going to do some kind of a keywords. And that's why you make sure that your resume or your linking profile uh, have the technical terms uh, rather than just talk about what you did. You need to have those technical terms. Maybe they search something, okay? But I, I believe that, that you know, they're, the big company they have the uh, HR team and the recruiters. They look at things. They, their job is to look for the, the resume. So, um, you know, I, I don't think the system is going to play a too important role there. Yeah. Yeah, Amanda's question, that one is a common question. Okay, so, so it's about the skill set. Okay, so let me find this one here. So in your resume, this is kind of one of the older version uh, well, it's still very popular. I'm talking about this one here, guys. So let me make this one a little bit larger. I don't know how to find this. Okay. So this one here, languages and technologies. And then you list the languages, C++, C, Java, Object C, all of those, and then uh, the tools, right? So you got this list. So Amanda's question was that um, you put uh, you know, proficient experience with that one. Yes, so it's, it's a very common technique, right? So you can put C++, parentheses, and then you can see proficient, expert, whatever. So there, there uh, I think three points. Number one, I think you only need to highlight the ones that you're really good, 
okay, you are master, you are proficient, and just highlight, that's fine. But then you don't want to put a pressure to every single one to say beginner, 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 intermediate, intermediate. That, that's useless, okay? Again, there's nothing you need to be that humble. Just highlight the one that's really good so that people will know that's good. Um, secondly, I think uh, there's a better way to say than proficient, experience, or master because there's no measurement. The ways I normally recommend students to put two ways, a, a common way is C++, parentheses, four years. Java, parentheses, three years. All right, so use the number of years to highlight your experience. All right, so that, that is one thing. Uh, a, a more, I won't say popular, but I think a much cooler way to write it, uh, rather than using the number of years, you put the number of lines of code you ever wrote. I saw that one from a couple of students last year. That's, uh, I, I got very excited. I, I think that's a pretty cool way to write it. So C++, parentheses, and then let me just write it here. Okay, so you got our languages, Java. One way, you know, again, you, you, you have all this C++ and Python, blah, blah, blah. What I said, number one is you can put this one proficient, all right, to highlight it, but then you don't have to say this one, Python, I'm, I'm just a beginner, okay? No, no need to do that, okay? So that's okay, just leave it there. Just highlight the ones that are good. But then better way to, to, to put them proficient, the one in the foyer, okay? So that people have an understanding. Or you can try to say, I wrote, you know, 50,000 lines of code. All right, so this is a very cool way. It looks very professional. And uh, who knows is it true or not, or, or is it big or not, but it looks like a lot. So, so I, 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 but in the same time, it showed that you're very professional. Okay, you're talking about line of code. I, I think that's a very cool way to write, right? So, you know, this, this different ways you can, you can think about. Yeah, just just estimate. You know, uh, take a look at the average or project, how how many lines, and then just estimate. Yeah. And also look at the GitHub. That that contribution page will show you some of the lines you you modify and change. Again, I, I would consider this one as a more kind of a fun way to write and maybe help you to stand out. Um, so that's, um, um, you know, I, I saw students putting that one. I, I definitely like that idea. All right, so for the resume format, I, I only recommend two, okay? This is the, the typical one, okay? As you can see, the kind of busy one page and then experience first, if you have those in education and then some other projects and then language skills, all of this. All right, so that's a typical one. Still people use that. I do see another common uh, format recently, okay? I, I see that a lot. Uh, let me see if I can find it. Software and general resume. Uh, another popular one you guys probably are using. I see are something like this. They do this kind of a two column thing, but a, a bigger column and a smaller column. column. I'm, I'm pretty sure some of you saw this one, right? This one, I do also see that a lot recently. Not bad, uh, because this one give you a better way to for the space, um, you know, they put a skill right here and then some of the little small item here where they put the experience here. Okay, so I, I seen that one a lot recently. So let me see if there are other examples. There's some kind of good format. Maybe this is also one. Yeah, something like this, All right? All right, so, so either way it works. Um, this is a, a little bit trending these two years, I think. All right, all oh, good. Some of you are using this kind of format.
Yeah, David. So, so the GitHub is a good. You know, a lot of you do put GitHub. I I think I explained that last time. And you, you if you do put it, make sure I think it's a good profile. Okay. Uh, I think for, if I were the one reading the the resume, if I want to, if I'm interested in, in your profile, if you have a link, I definitely will click on that one because the links on your resume or PDF is clickable. All right. So I I it doesn't. Um, take me too much time, I just do one click. And now I actually find out your GitHub profile page, it's a public, that shows a lot of information. But then you wanna make sure that I see a good, um, you know, a, a good profile. Okay, so let me see if I can find a good profile. Let me find some of our old students or to see if uh, there are any kind of good examples. This is a 480 project. Um, let me find some of the older students who graduated, this guy. All right, I see, but I don't know if he's active in, in, in GitHub, but he, he, he's right now in Apple, right? Uh, not, not too much, but, um, you know, but right now he's working, so I don't expect him to have a lot of symphony on right here. But when he was a student, as you can see here, so that's when he was a student, like 14, 15, he graduated in 16, all right? So this is actually not bad, okay? So as you can see here, this is the time he was in school. These are called good profiles, all right? But then if you open, if I open yours and then uh, it's, it's kind of like, this is okay, but some of yours only have like a one dot, okay? For the whole year, you contribute just one day. You wrote some code in one day, that's very bad to show, okay? I wouldn't even show it. So if you know that, I, I hope everyone started to kind of make some active commits to your, uh, to your, to your GitHub, okay? Um, I think I have a really good one. Okay, this is a, a kind of a show off. I think I already show off a couple of times. Okay, but you know I don't mind showing off again. Uh, you want to open mine, and then see how many commits I do. All right. Yeah, I'm I'm very humble person, but uh, I just want to <laughs> encourage all of you. All right. Um, okay, so you want to have this kind of a good profile. Okay, I I started you this one in 2012. Okay, I, I keep doing this one very consistently. Okay, so, uh, well, for different reasons, even though you, I, you know, this, this, this period of time I'm still in Amazon, I'm, I'm still doing a lot of the side project, okay, for the startup. So, but then this is a year when I, I quit uh, Amazon job. This is the part I do the startup purely for the startups. And then this part I didn't do much coding because I was mainly doing all the business stuff, <clears throat> running the demos, travel and then do the, to the, try to help with the sales guys and not much fun for me. Um, but then since 2014, and I started jumping to some other new project. Okay, oh, I, I forgot the, to see the number. So this year I did a 180, and then next year 280, next year I did a 340 commits, next year 400. And then, oh, this, this, this one here, okay, I already moved to Cal Poly, okay, that's the fall 2014. And then since then I do 400 commits, 600 commits, and then 600, and then 500, and then 600, and then this year I do 800. All right. Well, this year the 800 is 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 not too much. I have a lot of uh, most of these maybe not a commits. Okay, they are probably just some kind of documentation, some of the issues. Uh, it's really not that much coding, but but you know at least I'm I'm still very very active. All right, so you want to show this kind of things. And I can tell you guys, I, I got a lot of recruiters that they do the search for the GitHub profile. They reach me out for positions. Um, you know, I'm not very interested, but that, that, that's one channel people are searching for your profile, look at certain numbers threshold and then find, the, uh, find you. All right, so, so that's, that's make sure that this is easy, right? You just commit something every day. Some people wrote a script to commit something every day. So you got like a pure like green here. A lot of people have that one in, in, in GitHub, you can find it. Uh, you don't need to do that, but definitely uh, keep yourself, your, your, your profile very active. It's always a good thing to have. Yeah, yeah, right. So just make more commits. It, it shows a lot, okay. Because I can tell you most of uh, the, the college students don't have a very active profile. So if yours is better, then you can easily stand out yourself. Okay, um, you know, you're in this very competitive 
uh, situation in terms of job location for software jobs is uh, you remember the things I showed you. Okay, one position, hundreds of applicants. You should think about every single possible way you can to to help to differentiate yourself. Yeah, so when, when did you guys start using GitHub? So it looks like Catherine used that 2015. I think that's quite early, right? Uh, good, Catherine, you, you were coding in high school or? Yeah, man, I never, don't worry about that. I, I, when I was doing my internship in Amazon, um, I, I didn't even know what version control is. Uh, oh, actually, no, at that time I know, but I didn't know that too. But when I was in a PhD, okay, that was uh, already 2008 or 2009, I still didn't know version control. Okay, and then one of the, one of the professors actually sit with me and then told me this tool called SVN. That's, that's my first experience with uh, version control. So. Yeah, just pick it up. It's something very simple, no, nothing technical. Uh, just it's kind of a practice you keep. Okay, good, all right. And Catherine, see, I, I feel that you have uh, uh, quite a lot of experiences. Are you, uh, are you currently, did you do any internship before or are you currently doing kind of a development work or you already got offered? What's your situation? Good, what kind of uh, freelance work? Web development or some other development? Oh, good, very good, Catherine, yeah. Yeah, very impressive. Yeah. Okay, wow, that's uh, very cool, Cassie. You got uh, quite a lot of uh, good experiences. Yeah, this reminded me the the other student Sam. Some of you know know him. Sam, um, I forgot his last name. He he did a lot of freelancer also as well, and then he graduated in spring and then he's in Microsoft. Um, yeah, pretty uh, impressive student. <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot of people wasn't sure exactly what CS about. You know, a lot of students choose CS because of games or other reasons. All right, real basic. Okay, go ahead. with all of you and um, I, I, again this uh, this whole kind of a job application journey is um, it's no easy it takes time but it's uh, at the end it's all about execution take actions try things and then improve over the time in the first interview normally you get very nervous but then you start to realize that you know it's really nothing at the end and then you sometimes start to get like a 
bored with some of these phone calls. That's that's when you get really close to the uh, to the offers. Uh, I seen quite a lot of friends and some of the students spend well, almost one year to land an offer, um, but then it will be in a good offer, All right? So uh, that's that's how the job uh, software engineer jobs are doing in um, um, in the current industry. All right. Okay, guys. Well, um, very got to chat with you. Uh, uh, everyone try, you know, register some kind of a career fair and then get some preparation, see uh, how it goes. Uh, you know, the earlier you can experience all of this, the better. Okay. And next week, hopefully some of you can kind of share some good experiences with me. All right. So if you had any questions about uh, assignment, let me know. Um, I'll be still staying here for a little bit. Yeah, uh, I emailed you. Uh...